Hi, good afternoon and good evening. Um, we will just wait for two, three minutes uh, so that the more participants can add it. Uh, then we can start. Thank you. Okay, I think we can start now. Uh, thank you everyone uh, uh, for joining this uh, webinar as uh, we are always committed uh, to provide um, CPD events and to arrange some CPD events for our uh, uh, members as well, as well as for the non-members. Uh, so uh, today, uh, as you can see on the screen, our topic is uh, financial instrument. Uh, hopefully, the screen is visible to everyone. Ibrahim, you can see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Okay. So, um, as we mentioned that uh, the topic is uh, financial instruments, uh, IFRS 9. Uh, and uh, before going into uh, to the details and the topics which we are going to cover, I would just like to highlight a few things about IFA. Uh, I'll just take two, three minutes. Um, first of all, you know, uh, the members who, who have joined, they know about the IFA, but uh, for the non-members, just an introduction, an introduction that uh, IFA Institute of Financial Accountants was established in 1916, and uh, now um, the IFA is part of IPA group, so basically uh, Institute of Public Accountants of Australia as well as Institute of Financial Accountants of uh, UK, they are uh, having a group body, we call it IPA group. Uh, both IFA and IPA are the full member of uh, International Federation of Accountants, IFAC. Um, IFA is part of uh, IPA group with the world largest SME, small and medium enterprise focused accountancy group with more than uh, uh, 49,000 members, as well as the students across 100 countries. Uh, our member work with, uh, within, within micro and small to medium enterprise size entities uh, or micro or small to medium uh, size accounting practices, uh, advising on the micro and SME clients. So this is basically our uh, focus. Uh, just to update you, you basically on to the members, um, uh, they they have their annual return and renewal, renewal process is uh, uh, closing soon by 31st December 2021. 
so uh, so so it's, it's it's a message for the members who have joined the uh, the membership through IFA route. They should file their annual return as well as the renewal process uh, by 31st December. So now we are just moving towards the, to the topic. Uh, as we mentioned that the uh, topic uh, today topic is on IFRS 9, and we have a speaker, uh, Muhammad Ibrahim. Thanks uh, thanks for uh, giving your precious time. For, for this topic and uh, Ibrahim is basically uh, affiliate with uh, Institute of Financial Chartered Accountants of Pakistan and he has a, a diversified experience uh, uh, basically in uh, banking institutes, uh, fund and manufacturing, um, fund management and manufacturing companies. And um, uh, he, he is working uh, for last six years um, uh, with uh, different uh, uh, accounting and auditing firms. Uh, one of them was uh, Deloitte and currently he's working as, as a manage, as managerial role in RSM Saudi Arabia. So uh, over to you, uh, Ibrahim, and thank you so much for giving your time. Thank you, Salman, for the introduction. Uh, for all the participants, I would like to say hi, good evening to everyone. And uh, let me also introduce myself that as uh, Salman has introduced me very well, that I have a background, I, my most of the background with audit firms is associated with the audit of banking clients, which gives me a vast experience to understand the IFRS 9 implications in the financial institution. So inshallah, this session will be helpful. Before starting this session, I would like you guys to tell you something that IFRS 9 financial instrument is a very detailed and a very extensive topic with regard to the IFRS accounting standards. And uh, to summarize or to give you an overview of this standard in an hour or in an hour is not that easy. So we are not covering all the aspects of IFRS 9 today. Inshallah, we will see in this presentation that what we are covering and what we are not covering. If you guys, uh, everyone has, uh, everyone can hear me correctly. Can you just tell me that everyone has a clear voice? Can hear a clear voice for me? Yeah, uh, I can confirm you, Graham. I can uh, hear you clearly. If someone from the participants, they can okay. mention. Okay. okay, with respect to the objective of this, today's workshop, I would say, it's like first, as we all know that IFRS 9 financial instruments, what is financial instruments, why it is coming to being, which standard was used before with respect to financial instruments and why I, there is a new standard of IFRS 9. First, I will tell you some brief overview of that IFRS 9, how it will come into existence. And then as uh, many of us know that IFRS 9 financial instrument does not cover the definitions of financial assets, liabilities, and all the other financial instrument. It is being covered by IS 32. So in this presentation, you will also, I will also guide you or explain you about the definitions or the small brief overview of financial assets and financial liabilities from the part of IS 32. After that, we will discuss about the classification of financial instruments and how we're going to classify the financial instrument, how will, how, which financial instrument can be classified as which category? What are the categories defined by the financial instruments? And how can we classify those financial instruments in those different categories? We will understand that as well in this session. After that, I'm going to tell you about the measurement of financial instrument as per IFRS 10, how IFRS 9 guides us that how we can measure the financial assets and financial liabilities initially and also subsequently as well. With respect to de-recognition, we're not covering the de-recognition aspects of IFRS 9 in this presentation. However, if anyone have some questions regarding the de-recognition, they can tell me at the end of the presentation or can contact me through, through Salman or anyone uh, from the IFA. I can tell you, or we can arrange a new, new another presentation for that. After that, we also we will also covering the impairment of financial instrument, which is the very hot topic in IFRS 9, inshallah. So shall we start? Yeah. Okay. okay, guys. 
with regards to ifrs 9 over your ifrs 9 if we go like 5 to 6 years before there was no ifrs 9 that was is 39 who deals with all the financial instruments its recognition and everything and impairment as well but why ifrs 9 came into existence ifrs 9 basically if i'm not going into detail that what is 39 to tells us and what ifrs 9 i'm just giving you a small brief overview about that why ifrs 9 came into existence because in is 39 there was no clear intention or guidance regarding the impairment of financial assets from i certain and every company or every manufacturing company even because i have an i have a very vast experience of banking audits so i know the impairment of financial assets is very much impactful for the bank or other financial institutions so for the other financial institutions where when ifrs 9 was not there IS39 does not give you clear guidance about how you impair or how you test the impairment of the financial assets and then what they have their own policies based on the regulatory guidance for each, for every each country regarding their respective finan financial institution for the purpose of testing impairment but now in IFRS9 IFRS9 gives a detailed overview and detailed aspects and guidance about how you will test the impairment of a particular financial assets so this basically this is the major impact or this is a major transformation from the is39 to ifrs9 other thing there are other aspects but this was the major difference between those these two standards so i think this is this should be the brief overview why the ifrs9 comes into existence it will detail it will detailly guides you about the classification measurement of the financial instruments and also impairment we can come to the next slide but after before that i'll let you know that as i speak the de recognition of financial instruments and also the hedge accounting we are not covering this topic today because of the interest of the time okay salman we can move to the next slide okay small thing i just i guess, as i told you that ifrs 9 does not deal does not define financial instruments is 32 does that okay and also ifrs 9 does deal with the equity instruments i can give you a small overview about the equity instrument what is the equity instrument uh, anyone knows about the equity instrument anyone wants to participate or uh, or they want me to give you the overview about the equity instrument Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah. Okay. Normally, we are we are keeping uh, this uh, session okay. mute okay. for for everyone. But uh, they if they want, uh, they can raise their hand, and we can open the mic for them. Okay. Okay. If if any if anyone want to participate, I can wait for one minute to tell me about the equity instrument. It will be good for our session to be interactive. Because if the session is interactive, then it will be very good and. Okay. So, so uh, participants can raise their hand. I'll I'll open up the mic. Exactly. If no one is raising their hand, then we can explain them out of the way. Can give us. We can. I can give you the brief overview about the equity instrument as well. I don't think anyone is going to participate. Yeah. Someone has question. Okay. Okay, Danish. Okay. Danish is saying that it will be fine if you briefly overview about the equity instrument. Okay, Danish. Equity instrument. If I goes with the typical standard language, IS thirty two tells you that equity instrument is any contract that evidence a residual interest in the assets of an entity after deducting all of its liabilities. What does it mean? This this means basically the equity. For example, the shares. of your own company is your equity instrument shares of your own company is your equity instruments this needs to be understand that any this is the equity instrument why when equity instruments comes into financial asset when if you own an equity instrument of any other company this is your financial asset what does it mean for example you have invested in some shares of any other company those shares those investment in shares is your financial assets and 
the shares of the company is an equity instrument of for that company this is the this is the difference which normally needs to be uh, which which is a slight difference which needs to be understand that we as a company who invested in equity instrument is a financial asset for that company and for the other entity whose in whose shares have been invested by some other company is their equity instrument this is a brief overview okay, another thing why i for us nine IFRS 9 also does not deal with your investment. This should this is, should be understand that IFRS 9 does not deal with the investment in subsidies, associates, and just joint ventures. Anyone could ask me that you just tell Ibrahim that investment in the equity instrument is a financial asset. So why IFRS 9 does not deal with it? I'm telling you IFRS 9 does not deal with subsidies, associates, and joint ventures. Subsidy, so if you know about associate, associate means any significant influence in any other company, which normally occurs when you own 20% or more than 20% of the equity holding of in any other company. So IFRS 9 does not deal with these subsidies, associates, and joint ventures. There's a separate standards standard which deals with that. IFRS 9 deals with the investment which is below this significant influence. For example, if you invested, if you invest, if you had an investment in any other company, if you had an investment in any other company which is less than 20% or which does not constitute a significant influence in any other company, then this is a financial asset. It will consider it as a financial asset and does not be considered as an associate subsidy or joint venture. And it will be considered as a financial asset which can be dealt in IFRS 9. Are we clear? So we should move to the next slide. Salman. Yeah, I can see that question. Question. does equity instrument of your 100% own subsidy is your equity instrument does uh, one minute does equity instrument of your 100% own subsidy is your okay 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 uh, let me tell you I just take answered this question that you are asking me if I'm not if I'm not wrong you are asking me that 100 an equity instrument of your 100% owns subsidy is your equity instrument. Let me clear for that. This is a subsidy. Investment in a subsidy is never considered a financial asset. First need to understand this. Okay. And it is also not your equity instrument because it's not your entity. Yeah. As per the consolidation purpose, we can say this is an equity instrument of a group. Okay. If you consolidate a financial statement, this means that you are as a group, you own an interest in a subsidiary and that interest is an interest of a group and that is an equity instrument of a group. Okay. So are we clear? I think Salman, we are clear now. We can move to the next slide. Yeah. Okay. This, uh, as I told you in our agenda of this presentations, first we will, I will explain to you about the financial assets. Uh, this in uh, on your screen there is a definition from IS 32 para 11 about the financial asset. What is financial asset? Let me brief you before you read it. Any a cash is also a financial asset. An equity instrument is also a financial asset, as I explained to you. And then there is a definition that any contractual right. Contractual right means any right which can be constituted from a contract. Everyone here knows about the contract. What is contract? Okay any contract, any agreement between the parties, any contractual right to receive cash or other financial asset from any other entity. For example, there is a right to receive a cash. There's a receivable. There's a, you have give some loan to any other company. So you have a contractual right to receive some cash or any other financial asset. For example, any other financial asset means not cash. The, the, the amount you have, the amount, the right you have, can be settled other than cash terms, any other terms, any any settlement of any other liability, anything, any set of. So there is a contractual right to receive some benefit, basically. Okay. Or exchange financial asset or financial liability with another entity under conditions that are potentially favorable to the entity. This is the similar thing that you are exchanging your financial asset liability 
which is benefiting to your entity this means this is your financial asset for your company other aspect of this definition is that any contract that will or may be settled in equity's own equity instrument this is a difficult part of this definition which i would let uh, which i will tell you that for an easy understanding just think about that they are talking about a derivative instrument basically which we are not covering in this in this session but for us brief overview i can tell you any contract any contract in which a company a company which has a right to receive something has also a right to receive a variable number of entity's own equity instrument may be at a let, later date or at current date how to account for fair value changes uh, daniel <clears throat> daniel the this question can be answered in the later session when we are when i will explain you the measurement of financial instruments so i can cover this cover you you can you you will have the answer of this question in the later later financial instruments okay so this is the financial asset definition i will not go in detail about the derivative okay uh, for easiness uh, if uh, salman can come to the next slide i can get, there is a summary of this definition financial asset financial asset for easiness there is a cash equity instrument of another entity means investment in any other entity any contractual right to receive cash exchange financial exchange financial uh, <clears throat> interest in with another entity i think which i explained to you and the third one the difficult one the contract settled in own equity instrument which can be or which can be a uh, a co sorry it can be option as well okay like you are settling or you are obliged to receive some financial instrument on a variable date that can be a derivative which are not which we are not covering basically in today's session so i'm not going in detail for that inshallah if you raise the question i will explain you after the session or through salman if there is an and we can conduct another session for that salman we can go to the next slide uh we have a question from anita uh, she raised okay. her hand so i'm allowing allowing her to talk i already opened her mic okay yes, anita. and hello hello so my question is is the entities i think anita's voice equity instrument can it be classified hello hello yeah, i don't know salman but i cannot hear anita's voice clearly Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yes. So my question is: Is the entity's own um, equity instrument yeah. the entity's own? Can it be classified as a as its financial instrument, or it has to be of another entity's equity instrument? Yeah, I can. I think I can. It, your question is not clear. Basically, let me tell you that you are asking me equity instrument of another in, entity. can be the financial instrument equity instrument of your entity cannot be a financial instrument that is your question yes okay let me tell you <clears throat> let me tell you equity instrument of your entity is equity instrument of your entity is not a is just an equity instrument no? equity instruments means your share capital basically okay 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 you got my point so in finance yes. if i go with the financial instrument i need to understand that my financial instruments are financial assets financial liability how will i classify it either to hold to collect or through fair value through oci fair value through pnl what will be the impairment test is this, is it applicable or not so on my share capital there is no such kind of <laughs> ambiguity or unclarity so just to understand that equity instrument of another entity is always a financial asset okay And Okay. Of your equity is the share capital. Is the share capital. Okay, I am clear to you. Yes, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Salman, I think we can move now. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Now the financial liability. This is uh, the uh, on your screen. This is again the definition from the para eleven of IS thirty two about the financial liability. In the financial asset, you have a contractual right. 
and in financial liability, you have a contractual obligation, a responsibility, anything which you need to settle. So any contractual obligation to deliver cash or any other financial asset from another entity is basically an obligation you need to pay either through cash or through any other your financial asset. Then it becomes your financial liability. Similar to the financial asset, any exchange of financial asset or financial liability with another entity under conditions that are potentially unfavorable to entity means in case of financial asset, any benefits which are favorable to entity after exchanging your financial asset and liability becomes a financial asset. Or in, in, in the case of financial liability, exchange of financial asset and liability which is not favorable to the entity means that means that maybe loss or something then this is a financial liability okay so and the the other aspect of the definition is again we comes to the derivative any derivative which is on any option any put option you can say where a company is obliged to deliver any variable number of entities either at the current date or at a future date which can be considered as a derivative then it is a is an obligated contract which can, which can be considered as a financial liability. If uh, Salman can move to the, you can move to the next slide. There is a summary of this financial liability. Sim for an easy understanding, just understand this: that financial liability is any contractual obligation to deliver cash or any exchange of financial instrument with an unfavorable condition. Means a loss loss condition. Then there is a liability. And any contract settled in an entity's own equity instrument, that means that you're obliged to deliver some equity instrument, then obliged means you're responsible to deliver some equity instrument at a future date or a current date through an put option. And there is a financial liability. The put option, call option are all derivatives, comes into a derivative, a derivative context of the financial instrument, which I am not covering today. That's why I'm not going in detail, okay? Okay, Salman, we can move to the next slide. Uh, before, sorry, sorry, Salman, before moving to the next slide, uh, I want I want you guys to give me an answer of one question. If anyone knows, anyone can tell me that what are the assets in your balance sheet, which cannot be considered a financial asset? Anyone can answer me on that? <clears throat> Yeah, someone raised the hand. Let me open up the mic. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Hi. Uh, hello, it's Kamal Bari. Well, any uh, physical assets uh, can be considered as, uh, I mean, the real assets uh, instead of, let's say, financial assets, which does not, financial assets have to have some sort of contractual obligation added to it, but uh, real asset does not need to. Okay. So any other asset you think which cannot be financial asset, which I, you think uh, standard specifically tells you about it? Well, uh, cash itself can be considered as uh, cash or let's say cash equivalents, uh, which are not uh, offering you any future benefits. And let's say, for example, if I consider a negotiable instrument, for example, uh, if I have a check, if I receive a check, okay, then that check cannot be considered as a financial asset. Uh, I should again, rather consider again, again, it. Can you tell this again? Sorry. So let's say if I receive a check, so that is a that is equivalent to cash. So I will I'm going to basically put it as cash, isn't it? When I receive it. Okay. So that is not going to be a financial asset because it is it does not offer uh, any additional amount of cash at a later period of time or does not have any contractual obligation to pay uh, for another entity to pay some amount of money at a future period of time uh, other than the stipulated period, which is a very short period of time, not a long one. Okay. Or am I confusing myself? <laughs> a little bit confusing. Let me clear you something. Let uh, <clears throat> I anyone or anyone more from like Kamrul who wants <clears throat> Who, who wants to participate in this question? I think yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Let let, let any, me any asset which is uh, any asset okay, okay. which is uh, covered by the 
any other um, uh, IS, something like IS2 inventory or uh, 16 PP40 uh, 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 investment. So uh, any asset, uh, those are covered by another uh, IS. Uh, it, it will not be considered as uh, financial in, uh, instrument. Yeah, that, that, could, that could be correct. Anyone, more, anyone else? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed Kamrul. Ibrahim yes, Akram also wants to say something. Salman, you can open his mic. Yeah, he is. Um, just, I already unmute. I don't he has know. to. I think Ibrahim, from your his, side, the mic is phone. off. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think we should continue now. Can you hear me? Hello, Islam Ali. Okay. Okay, Brian, we can hear you now. Yes, sir. Uh, as you asked, like, you know, investment properties that is being dealt by separate uh, IS-40, I believe, and IS-16 PPE. Uh, so other than, you know, uh, IFRS uh, assets that is being covered by IFRS-9. So all those assets, we can say, uh, does not belong to IFRS-9. Investment properties, um, yeah. PPEs. Right, right, right. Absolutely right. Uh, Muhammad Rafil also give the correct answer. You give the correct answer. But there, are, there is something else also which cannot be considered as financial assets. I would like, I, I would want an answer for that as well. But no, intangible you assets? Not intangibles. I'll, I'll let you know. Azad, you want to sure. speak or we should continue uh, with the. Yes, Aslam Ali. Uh, my opinion uh, this is a bonus share is not considered as a financial as, uh, asset now. Bonus share, okay. <clears throat> bonus share, you can say it's basically an equity instrument, right? Yes. <clears throat> okay, and because it, there, it does not fall into the definition as well. <clears throat> For I, I can tell you about some, there are some guidance from the IFRS 9. After releasing of IFRS 9, there are separate guidance. There is also different additions to the IFRS 9. Let me give you one basic concept of financial asset. All the financial assets are financial assets based on my understanding and after reading all the provisions in the standards, all the financial stand assets are basically those assets which are linked to the credit risk. All you guys are know about the credit risk, right? Every financial asset is linked to the credit risk. Where there is a credit risk, then there is a financial asset and there is a risk of testing the impairment, right? Okay. So there are some assets which does not constitute a constitute basically credit risk and, which are, and they are not financial assets. And this is also defined in the IFRS 9 standard as well. That for example, a contract asset, anyone, uh, all you guys know about the contract asset, okay? Contract asset also covers covered in the IFRS 15 as well, but a contract asset is a deferred revenue. Basically a deferred revenue, everyone knows it. So it does not constitute a financial asset as per IFRS 9. Other than that, <clears throat> other than that, prepaid expenses are also not financial asset because they, you've paid advance, they're not financial asset. There's no credit attached to it. And the most important thing, any receivable from the government authority, it's a general principle all over the world. Any receivable from the government authority has a 0% exposure to the credit risk and that receivable will not be a financial asset. Like for example, we have different, uh, currently I'm in Saudi. In Saudi, there is always a VAT refundable, VAT receivable from the government in your balance sheet. It does not constitute a financial asset and it does not have a separate accounting standard as well. As you guys told, you all are correct that there, there is a separate standard for a particular asset, then it will not be covered in the financial instrument. So the, yeah, anyone ask me? So, so I think Ibrahim, uh, I think uh, uh, there is a thin line difference here. Like if yeah, yeah. any, I mean, uh, asset which is uh, to be recovered as like regulatory asset, like VAT. Yeah. So yes, we can say those are not financial assets. So what about uh, 
like if if any entity is having a trading or manufacturing or whatsoever the business with the with the government i think if they have a purely trade receivable so those can be considered as a as a uh, financial assets very very right question very right question there is a debate for this mm -hmm. type of asset because i also worked in pakistan as well and i have i have an experience of auditing the basically the government bank in pakistan and as salman gave raised this question that a government bank has gone, government bank has normally transaction with the government government bank has normally transactions with the government and there is a huge amount of receivable from the government so what will be there if it is not a financial asset then there will be no risk of impairment so let me tell you before the implication of ifrs 9 i have done the audit of a, of a, of a abc bank in pakistan which is a lot amount of transaction with the government and as per the basel uh, let me introduce you about the basel what is basel in all over the world when you test the impairment ifrs 9 there are general principles to how to calculate the probability and default and everything it covers through basel basel is a separate guidance for this uh, valuation technique so basel also works in pakistan as well as per the basel principles and also as per the regulatory principles to test the impairment there is specifically written that all the receivable from government has a 0% exposure to risk credit risk and there is no test of impairment so if i if i read the provisions of ifrs 9 as per my knowledge and understanding i can give the answer to salman's question that yes those receivable i will not cons consider those receivable as a financial asset in my balance sheet yes there may be different answers from different other <laughs> speakers but as, as per my understanding of ifrs 9 any receivable from the regulatory authority not only the tax receivables also the trade receivables can also be not considered as a financial asset if it is directly receivable from the government authority so i i'm but, clear but, but it should be it should be it should uh, you know qualify yeah. the pure definition of receivables as well i mean it should not be not understand just, yeah. understand understand truly understand but uh, it can be uh, it can be right as a fan, as a receivable but as per the because the disclosure of ifrs 9 is covered through ifrs 7 so when we disclose the financial asset and liabilities in your in our the in the balance sheet i myself as per my knowledge of ifrs 9 ifrs 7 i will not disclose those disclose those government receivable in my financial instrument disclosure i will not do that hmm. okay, okay i'm i'm basically trying trying to extend extend uh, the the definition uh, but uh, okay let's say if, if we have a one uh, one uh hospital government hospital and they they are basically you know um i mean providing the medical services to all the um government institute so okay. while while calculating the ecl model or ecl basically uh, the provisioning should we exclude yeah, yeah. all those government authorities uh, for the sake of this uh, we should do that. we have to yeah. do that because if the receivable is coming from directly a government authority then there is a zero exposure yeah there can be an exception what exception is that i have read a separate paper for that there can be exception because if there is a country in the world who is who is being faced through a hyper inflationary situations where a government is also in debt a significant debt then then then, then you have to consider the economic factor of that country Mm, and like then you consider either that is because there is a credit risk or not then you then you have to apply the hyperinflationary accounting standard mm -hmm. okay that's good i think we have uh, many things to cover so daniel is asking what is the difference between monetary assets and financial assets i think the guidance which we have discussed here i think this question is already answered that what is the difference between the monet monetary asset involves the amount of money okay and there can be any monetary asset yeah i am not telling you all the monetary assets are financial as financial asset but some monetary asset can be financial assets okay hafiz mohammed um, hafiz imran mohammed also raised a question that what about the labor guarantee can be considered as a financial asset uh, i need to understand about the labor guarantee what do you mean basically or i can answer you this later in the session okay Mm. I think we should move to the next slide. We have one question from Kamrul. 
okay. uh, sorry to interrupt. Sorry to interrupt. I was just uh, uh, trying to understand the issue uh, and uh, okay. just to clarify a confusion. For example, okay. let's say I have put my cash in a bank account. Now, okay. obviously, some sort of credit risk attached with it from the bank's dimension. Okay. But should I consider exactly. that cash? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But but should I consider that cash uh, at bank, for example, as my financial asset? Exactly. You have to consider it as a financial asset. Because it the, the basic concept I gave you, all the financial assets are attached to some credit risk. And you cannot deny that bank does not have any credit risk. Yes, bank have a credit risk. You have a lots of rating from Moody and other uh, other economic uh, websites. You will find ratings of a particular mm -hmm. banks why they are why there are ratings because these ratings are based on the credit risk so cash at banks and also cash in hand also constitute always a credit risk and you also need to test the impairment on your cash at banks and cash at hand as well mm, but uh, there is no condition attached as far as the marketability is concerned is there again sorry marketability what means there is contextual, oblig uh, contextual obligation and uh, the marketability. So is marketability a concern here in the definition of, let's say, financial assets? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, Salman, can you move to the financial asset definition again? It has to be clear. Yeah, yeah I understand. Again, uh, if you see a financial asset definition does not give you, it is clearly saying a financial asset is any asset that is cash not a contractual obligation or not a contractual right. Okay. In the second paragraph, it is saying contractual right to receive cash, but it is also saying a cash is also a financial asset. IS 32 specifically telling you, specifically tells you that financial asset is a cash. In IFRS, uh, is that uh, is that being included? What, sorry? Again, IFRS mean, is not IAS. defining the, the, the yeah. financial asset and liability, but IS 32. IS yeah, 32 because, is doing it, but IFRS yeah. 9 does not cover it. Yeah, I, I just as I told you, uh, as I tell you guys in the initial start of my presentation, that IFRS 9 does not deal with any definition of IFRS oh, uh, or okay. any financial instrument. If you need to understand IFRS 9, you have to learn three standards parallelly. That is IS 32, IFRS 9, and IFRS 7. IFRS and 7 is basically disclosures to the financial instruments. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Awesome. So, Sapoli. I have to know if we have all. Yeah. Another I think question, Dr. Sapoli, uh, I opened up his mic. Yep. Yes, Dr. Hello. Yes, uh, yeah. Hello. Hi. How are you? Thank you for you. Just uh, actually, I'm asking if there is a two treatment, uh, they are uh, equity related uh, through uh, two for the treatment. Yes, I uh, have a, a little bit confused for the treatment in equity uh, regarding IFRS 19. If you have any idea or just to clear for me these two uh, treated in equity regarding the IFRS 9. Okay. That is all my question. Mm, if you, sorry, if you have, I, uh, I, I just uh, two three. There is a treatment. Some treatment. It was so two treatment. It was uh, do it in the equity as an investment related to IFRS one. I'm not uh, just. I have a little bit confused. If there is something like that, uh, just see. Uh, sorry, sorry, Sefuddin, but I'm not able to understand your question. If it, if it would be in, good if in, you write that question in the text, I'll answer you correctly. Okay, in the let me session, just the later date, but uh, I will answer you. No worry. It's, a, okay. it's okay. No more, no more problems. Okay. Thank, okay. Thank you. I think we should move Salman, and we should uh, let the question answer at the end of the session because we don't have much time, and the presentation uh, yeah. is a lot to do. That's that. Uh, this is IFRS is also a, always a detailed topic. Yeah, I think there are some questions which, but I can, I think I will answer. Yeah, we can, we can answer more. at the end uh, as a conceptually we have discussed. Definitely, we'll answer. I think we should also focus on the content. Yeah. I think we uh, we have had a, 
a much amount of value on this financial asset and liability we should move okay okay now the classification aspect okay classification ifrs 9 has de guides a detailed aspect of the classification that how will how we will classify our financial asset and liability in our balance sheets and how we we'll treat it as well and the classification is always tricky for the financial asset and financial liability is always the easy part the most uh, different uh, different thing ifrs 9 tells you which is extremely different from the is 39 is the two characteristics test that is the business model test and the contractual cash flow characteristics test what is the business model test as you see in your screen before classifying any financial assets in any category basically there are three categories defined by ifrs 9 that is categorizing categorizing financial asset at amortized cost classifying financial asset as fair value through profit or loss or classify financial asset at a fair value through other comprehensive income uh, salman again move to the previous slide okay okay so how, how can we classify the financial asset into three categories we need to understand the two characteristics of a particular financial asset number one we need to perform a business model test first this is the initial phase to be classifying the financial asset that what is the objective of holding the financial asset what is the objective are we going to collect only the contractual cash flows attached to that asset means if you have a debt instrument you are going to have the interest payments on that only or will receive the principal at the end or you can also have the intention to sell that asset or you don't have any intention to receive the cash flow only have an intention to sell that asset if there is a increase in fair value what is your intention what is your business model to hold such a financial asset first you need to understand that the other characteristic ifrs 9 tells you and how your cash flows are how your contractual cash flows are are the cash flows from the financial asset on the specified dates solely payments of principal and interest on the principal outstanding or is there something else this means you have a financial asset that for example you have a lease receivable which gives you an interest on a specific dates or which will give you a payments of principal on the specific dates like quarterly half yearly or yearly so you need to understand your cash flow characteristics how you will receive the cash flows directly at the end or you receive some interest payments at the specified dates or there is something else or the cash flow is only the sell off all the sell all the uh, or the cash flow is just only the cash which you received after selling that financial asset you need to understand these two characteristics before classifying any financial asset moving forward to the next slide suman so as uh, if anyone has the question uh, any question on that two characters you can ask me later but before that i need i am going to give you an understanding of that how can we classify the financial asset into three categories first category is the amortized cost that classification of financial asset at amortized cost you need to understand that if a financial asset falls into the category which fulfills both of the two conditions what are the two conditions one condition is that you have a business model only to hold the financial assets to collect the contractual cash flows attached to it and you are you have no intention to sell it at any time you got my point that you only uh, you have only like you have a lease receivable and you don't want the lease receivable to uh, write off or to sell that lease receivable to someone as or you have investment in any financial asset at any other company for which you only have an intention to receive the dividend you are not going to sell that investment then this means that your business model is only to collect the contractual cash flow and not to sell them the other characteristics that that the cash flows from the asset are only the payments of principal and interest for example debt securities receivables loans you have you have provided loans to the other companies all these type of financial assets which is which in your screen as example like debt securities receivables or loans mostly mostly 
फॉल्स और अचीव दीज टू करेक्टरिस्टिक्स विच by which you can classify these assets as at amortized cost how can we how we treat the amortized cost how we measure at amortized cost we will uh, see in the later slides okay uh, on the next slide oman how can we classify the financial asset at fair value through other comprehensive income fair value through other comprehensive income there are two sub categories okay one minute sorry sorry just an interruption again uh, starting from the start that fair value through oci other comprehensive income how can we categorize a financial asset through fair value through oci again we need to check do those two test we have mentioned earlier that if financial asset meets the contractual cash flow characteristic that is Ibrahim, we lost you. Hello. Just a second. Let me see. The more. Yeah, Ibrahim, we lost your voice for last one minute. Can you repeat again? Classification. Uh, Sorry, but I don't know. My meeting was interrupted. Yeah, FEOCI. You, you, you can explain from the start. Okay, sorry, I can explain it from the start. Classification of uh, financial asset through OCI, other comprehensive income. Again, there are two. We need, you need to understand both of the two characteristics to understand how can you classify an financial asset into other comprehensive income. First, as at amortized cost, you have an only one intention. What is that? That you are not going to sell your financial asset. you will you only have an intention to collect the contractual cash flows attached to that financial asset but if you want to classify a financial asset through other comprehensive income your business model is either to collect the contractual cash flows or you can also sell that financial asset i am telling you guys that in general practice as i see in many industries these type of asset which are classified as fair value through oci are normally are are normally strategic investments that you have in you have you have made an investment into an any other company or there are some other debt instruments which you have intention not only have an intention to collect the contractual cash flows attached to it but you can also sell at a let, later that date where you think that the, the fair value is increased and you have sell them so at only at that kind of business model you can classify a financial asset through oci okay but you can voluntarily choose to measure some equity instrument at fair value through oci or some instrument at fair value through pnl it's up to your intention at the initial recognition of a particular financial asset but let me know you let let me know let me give you one uh, tell you one thing as per ifrs 9 because i am not also covering the reclassification aspect of ifrs 9 today because of the lapse of because of the limitation of time just tell you one important thing that again regarding the equity instrument at fair value through oci equity instrument you guys all know that if you choose an equity instrument through fair value through oci then there is an irrevocable op option at initial recognition that you cannot change you cannot change your uh, your option to choose like for example at the initial phase you select to classify your equity instrument in some other company like a financial asset through oci so you cannot subsequently change the classification to fair to fair value through pnl but for the other financial asset you can subsequently change the classification after justifying your intention 
change of intention. But for the equine instrument, you cannot do that as per IFR sign. Okay. Come to the next slide. Uh, we have some question. Uh, okay. Uh, from Daniel, like for equity instruments in in the in the one year, fair value yeah. changes are accounted through profit and loss. Okay. And the next year, uh, whether for the same equity instrument, the changes in the fair value can be counted through OCI? No, the, I already give the answer now. It cannot be possible because uh, standard standards IFRS 9 specifically tells that at initial measurement, there's the volatility choice of you, choice available to you for the equity instrument that you can classify equity instrument either at fair value through OCI or fair value through PNL, but this is an irrevocable action. There is a specifically written in IFRS 9 regarding the classification of equity instrument that there will be an irrevocable action at the initial recognition, which stops you, limit you to change the classification subsequently. So I think this is the answer is complete. Hmm. The next one action. is um, okay. if the equity instrument uh, a value changes through OCI when instruments are sold, then any gain and loss should be debited to PNL or OCI. Should be to be should be OCI. Uh, this is the this is the uh, usually understand in the next slides when we cover when we cover through measurement. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. We should move to the next slide. Um, so Sefaldin is saying, can you explain the two treatments of equity in investment? One on financial note and other you can say equity. So basically, I think uh, the doctor is talking about. Sefuddin, I did not receive OPD any. Uh, I did not receive any question again from him. I, anyway, so he, I think he is uh, trying to ask you, uh, which we are explaining now, the two okay. two treatments for OCI as well as to PNL. This is uh, actually he wants to say. Okay, I think okay. Yeah, uh, we are explaining now. So we have uh, hand raised by. By by Rizwan. Yeah, I allowed him to talk. One minute. Huh? I'm just reading the Safuddin question. Can you explain the two treatments of equity instrument shown and other one on the equity instrument hold and key supplier is measured at fair value? How to close the change in the fair value? Yeah, Safuddin answer can be explained when we are covering the measurement section. Okay. okay, and I, I, I see your slide. You are going to explain it. It is a good part of this one. I get it in this slide. The second one, I think that is it will be on your next yeah, slide. Yeah, yeah. Or... So, Fidin, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to cover cover the things step by step because if I jump onto the final stage, then it, I think it will be just... No, no, exactly. Uh, that is, it's okay. Right? It's okay. No more problem. No more problem. Go ahead. Thank no, you. No, no, you can ask any question. You are welcome. Okay, okay. Uh, can, can, uh, I just want uh, it's me this one. Um, uh, I hope everyone is okay. Uh, I just yeah, wanted yeah. to ask uh, that uh, the equity instrument classification uh, into uh, fair value through other uh, comprehensive income and through professional loss. Uh, every equity instrument that has uh, that is basically uh, acquired. At any point yeah. in time, can be classified into two, or the equity instruments as an organization's decision has to be classified into one of those categories. So there's there's an organization decision, an organization decision based on the intention, right? Yeah, yeah. But if if the equity instrument that is being purchased uh, has different uh, intentions at different point in time, for example, if uh, a company uh, acquires an uh, equity instrument uh, at a uh, let's say uh, uh, year two thousand twenty one. And they classified uh, through uh, OCI. And uh, yeah. in the next year, when they acquire a new equity instrument, they can they classify it through profit and loss, or they have to always classify it through. Now, now I understand your question that you are saying that, for example, there are two financial instruments. There are two equity instruments. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yes, right. Yes. For one equity instrument, they have select uh, an option for fair value through PNL, and for the one option, they have select a fair value through OCI. Right. Yes, that's this is your question. question. Yeah, very good question is one. This is basically you can say, I, I can tell you based on my understanding of the IFRS, this, uh, this question again comes during my experience of banking audits because they have such kind of investments. And normally the company 
use this loophole of IFRS 9 to increase or decrease or to adjust their profits. Let me know. Let me tell you, right? Okay. Because as an IFRS 9, IFRS 9 never ever tells anywhere. I did not read it. Maybe there is something, but as per my knowledge and as per my reading, I never find any terminologies there that if the policy of a company is to select an equity instrument at fair value through OCI, then it should be applicable to all the financial equity instruments. There is nothing written there. Okay. 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 So this means Got the equity instrument can be uh, one equity instrument can be selected at fair value through PNR and one equity instrument can be selected through fair value through OCI. But, but, but also as I'm just coming a small uh, little, little bit through auditing standard, I'm not going into detail, but if you come to the auditing standard, if you read through auditing standard, they will tell you if this kind of decision made by the company, then you need to assess very critically that why they are doing this. They should have a brief justification for changing their business model for one equity instrument, other uh, fair value through PNL and one equity instrument fair value through OCI. There should be a very detailed uh, justification for that. Okay, what is your question now? But I think uh, IS1 also, you know, talking about the consistency. Uh, yeah, the that's the what I'm telling you. IS1, yeah. I, for example, for invest, if I come to the IS40 standard, investment property. Yeah. Investment property specifically tells you the standard that if you classify your one investment property at fair value and not at cost, then you need to classify all your investment properties at fair value. You okay. get, you're getting up and IS, IS40 yeah, yeah, I, I, you. And IS1 tells you that you need to comply with the group policy. Yes, that was that was due to uh, which actually my uh, original question arose. Because yeah. uh, uh, I myself am uh, I'm, uh, working as a head of financial planning in a bank, and uh, yeah. there can be a situation where uh, one equity instrument can be distinguished very separately from another equity instrument. For example, yeah, as, per, as per my knowledge, I'm telling is, you that you can do that. Okay, so basically, we can formulate a policy that states that a certain category of uh, equity instruments, for example, in a certain industry. Those equity instruments will be routed through OCI. Yeah, and the there is one, there is one, let me correct you. Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt you, but mm -hmm. let me tell you again. This is not a policy. Classification is not a policy again. Classification is not a policy. Okay. You can say it's an estimate or you can say it's a business model, but not a policy. Right? A policy okay. should be consistent. A business model can be changed for different instruments. Right? Okay. So there's a so, difference between the policy at, and at the, the end, Okay, so the, at the end, IFRS 9 typically does not bar anyone to distinguish or to categorize different equity instruments at different time point in point in time to categorize them either through uh, profit and loss or through OCI. Uh, but it has yeah. to be consistent within that equity type or uh, within that business model that the organization is doing. Exactly. exactly. Intention. Intention, my knowledge, uh, this is, yeah, Salman should like to add something. Yeah, as I was just saying, it's it's about intention as well. And yeah, it's about it's intention, it's not a policy. Well. Yeah, okay. Got it. Thank you. Thank you for addition. Okay. Yeah. Uh, next one is we the, have uh, uh, Mahabubur Rahman. Yeah, sorry. Mahabubur Rahman wants to ask something. I think we will cover only definition today. <laughs> I think so. We cannot move to the impairment section. We have to arrange a new new session for that, Salman. <laughs> okay, so Mahbub is here now. Yeah, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I think he's. Uh, I'm trying to unmute him, but he has to unmute himself. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> I think. Uh, meanwhile, we can move further. Okay. Next slide. Yeah, next slide. Again, the last classification is through PNL. 
uh, as we have a detailed discussion regarding the amortized cost classification fair value through oci classification now i can tell easily that all the other financial assets which are left can be classified fair value through pnl to be clear and to be exact normally not no, normally but every derivative financial assets are automatically classified at fair value through pnl i will not go into detail about about the derivative financial asset because we can cover it into another se session okay moreover regardless previous two categories anyone may decide to designate the financial asset at fair value through pnl at its initial recognition you need to assess the characteristics if your business model is only to only to sell that financial asset and not to collect any contractual contractual cash flow your business model is typically to basically you you have a model that okay purchase investment sell investment purchase investment sell investment like a, like in the stock exchange trading then this is a typical business model for which your financial assets cash should be classified at fair value through pnl at your initial recognition okay, okay. Uh, and regarding the equity instrument we already discussed in detail also rizwan has has included a, a good value addition to this presentation as well thank you on that we can move to the next slide any one again have any other question can ask me because now th on this screen uh, i i want you guys to read this screen before i will tell you this is a basically a summary i prepared for you guys for the classification of financial asset which gives you a clear picture and easy way to how can you classify your financial asset through all these three categories uh, just take 2 minutes and read it and if any question regarding this summary or you if you think that there is some error or anything which i should add please let me know thank you and meanwhile meanwhile uh, i think the 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 participants are reading we can we can answer for further questions uh half is imran is saying against labor visa we need to deposit some amount in the bank on behalf of government in uae so is it a financial asset i'm just reading his question no huh? one minute open i did not have any open question salman i don't know i think i have it anyway so i am reading for you basically yeah. against labor visas they need to deposit some money in the bank on behalf of uh, government in uae so is it is it a, a financial instrument i don't think so uh, okay and I, i understand this basically they are saying the advance ekama fees right yeah something like that or or basically visa fees simply we can say yes let me tell you one thing not going towards the government receivable but as i told you prepaid asset is also itself is not a financial asset as per ifrs 9 definition ifrs 9 typically in his standard tells you that prepaid advance advances basically are not the financial assets because we have advanced there is no financial credit risk attached to it cryptocurrency is it a financial asset cryptocurrency uh, let me who to who asked this question azhar I, I can repeat yeah. for you so that we we have less time. So quickly. Okay, tell me. Yeah, cryptocurrency is it a financial asset? I don't think so. It's not meeting the definition of. Yeah. Um, big, uh, basically, big. crypto are not financial asset. The major. But this there is a debate on this. I cannot answer like. absolutely on that because there's a debate still going on between the ifac community regarding the cryptocurrency and in which standard which standard will deal the cryptocurrency right okay because the major issue as per my understanding the cryptocurrency does not have any physical substance attached to it that's why it cannot be considered as a financial asset yeah maybe in the future date the authorities will attach any physical substance to the cryptocurrency a digital currency i would say then it can be considered as a financial asset nowadays i don't know because i did not read the those discussion papers regarding the cryptocurrency there is there is something crypto ex existence of discussion papers regarding the cryptocurrency by the ifac community that either it can be considered in 
as an intangible asset or IFRS 9 or whatever. But I did not know. That's why I'm not want to comment on that. But as per my knowledge, I would let you, I can tell you that there is no physical substance so that it cannot be a financial asset. Uh, my, there is a question of mine, Rizwan mm, here. Okay, again. Rizwan uh, again. Yeah, yeah, uh, sorry. I just yes, wanted sir. to ask that uh, you were uh, informing us that uh, any instrument that does not have a credit, uh, basically uh, risk attached to it, for example, uh, receivables from government uh, do not fall yeah. under uh, financial instruments, right? Uh, but the bond basically what uh, okay basically but, correct, uh, let me correct you mm -hmm. based on my understanding i'm telling you for the basic understanding of if everyone now tell me your question okay my question is that the government bonds uh, of uh, yeah. your own country for example within pakistan the government bonds by the government uh, of pakistan uh, they would be classified as financial instruments because they, they uh, imbue uh, a markup uh, to it. Although there is no credit risk, uh, it's, it's a basically, basically a 100% guaranteed uh, cash flow. But they will yeah, be yeah. classified as financial instruments, right? Yeah, let me tell you. If I if you ask me about Pakistan, I'll let you know. There are there are PIBs. Yes, Any country, PIBs there are some bonds like will... Pakistan investment bonds. Okay, the yes. PIBs. If you, re if you read the regulation of the Pakistan, as a Pakistan country, there is a regulation number eight, if I remember, prudent regulation number eight. The PIBs have a zero exposure to risk, right? And yes. the impairment is always zero of the PIBs. Okay, yes. consider that, yes, it can be considered a financial asset or financial liability. As per my understanding, I again will tell you that it cannot be financial asset, but there is something attached to it. There is no credit risk attached to it, but because the PIBs are invested into some other business, not only Recording the government. in progress. Yeah, who is it? Okay. Uh, well, uh, the next one is uh, quickly, quickly, we have to quickly answer now. Ibrahim, uh, uh, whether warranty provision is a financial ability? Labor guarantee? Uh, warranty provision, I think no. No, no, no. Warranty provision. Liability is basically financial. Warranty provisions. Yeah, like uh, you know, product warranty, something. So I'm just brainstorming. One minute. Give me one minute. Because it's sometimes not settled in cash, but we we have we have to basically give uh, you know. Uh, we have to extend our services against that. Warranty provisions, normally warranty provisions, if not confirmed, it's a contingent liability, okay? Yeah. Normally. That's fine. To be it's not financial liability, I think. Not be considered as a financial liability. Hmm. So what because about that? It's a contingent liability, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so labor guarantee similar similarly Hafiz Imran is saying is labor guarantee uh, on is, the uh, labor guarantee uh, Hafiz Imran if you can wait uh, uh, at the end of the session you will have my contact just WhatsApp me uh, I will give you a detailed answer to it because I I need to I can give the answer now but I don't want to be misconfusing or misconcept misconcept you so give me a time like tonight or tomorrow I'll give the answer to that. Labor guarantee. I need to understand the terms of the labor guarantee now. That and uh, to be exact. After that, I can answer you correctly. Okay. What about the debt instrument? Whether we can we can change the change. Okay. Duplication. What about the debt instrument? Whether we can change the classification from PNL to OCI next year? Uh, I think this is not allowed. I mean, he's saying if if one year we are we are having as a PNL. But next year we are considering as a OCI. Yeah, for that instrument, uh, we can do that at any. There is no irrevoc irrevoc irrevocable election to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. For if you are if you have a, a fair value through OCI, you can come to the PNL. Okay, but uh, if you but, are uh, but, if but, you are fair value through PNL, good. then you cannot go to fair value through OCI. Sorry. If you are at initial recognition. Only for debt instrument, not for equity instrument, 
if you are uh, if you in, uh, if you have an intention or if you select an option to fair value through oci for debt instrument and in the next year if you can justify that your business model has changed only to sell then you can classify again to fair value through pnl but this will be the last time now you cannot change but at initial recognition at initial recognition if you classify a financial asset at fair value through pnl then you cannot go to fair value through oci to be correct and also we are not covering this reclassification aspect in today's session but for the brief overview i can give you this answer for the details mm -hmm. it will be covered in the next session or something anyway okay because it's a reclassification aspect of ifrsm which we are not covering today okay um is our redeemable preference shares financial liability since contractual obligation to pay in cash what is redeem? redeemable financial what again sorry redeemable uh, preferential shares basically redeemable preferential shares okay redeemable for the redeemable preferential share preference shares you need to understand basically normally redeemable preference shares means that uh, yeah redeemable preference shares will be considered as a debt instruments mm. okay is it considered as a debt instrument will be treated in the ifrs 9 as a debt instrument normally okay because the preference dividend and it is redeemable this means this is typically a debt not an equity instrument right so you can classify it through pnl Okay, so all questions answered. Uh, one last, uh, Kamul Bari. Yes, Kamul. Uh, thank you. Um, it was uh, really interesting and rigorous. So uh, I was just uh, wondering about one, uh, two issues basically. First of all, uh, you were talking about redeemable debt instrument, and def definitely they are debt instruments, as you have mentioned. Another yeah, yeah. Uh, dimension of it can be, let's say, convertible sukuks which are sometimes given, uh, or let's say some conditions are attached to it, like if you want, you can convert it to equity. In those cases, yeah. what should be the issue? This is number one. And uh, number two is basically a common, which is I think uh, cryptocurrency and digital currency, uh, none of them uh, should be considered as financial assets, isn't it? Yeah, right. Okay, thank you. Just, just confirming, thank you. Yeah, yeah, Kamral, sorry, uh, your, uh, your question uh, regarding the convert, compound instrument right uh yes convertible convertible uh, instrument which can be converted into equity convertible sukuk yeah yeah i For understand example. your question but let me tell you that as i speak in the moment that i only have the one hour of this session and you see this <laughs> we did not come to the measurement and i'm not covering the equity compound instrument but i can answer you this that this question about also because the compound in it is also comes to the IS32 again, not in the IFRS 9. IS32 covers the compound instrument definition, which I did not mention in this presentation today, because I know if I mention this, it will be a long topic. A compound okay. instrument also uh, basically covers two aspects, like it can be converted to equity instrument also, and also be converted to the other part as well. So for to understand that yes what would be the classification it is a very uh, detailed understanding and i can answer you if you contact me but i i don't think i should add this answer to this presentation it will make different confusions and uh, it should be the uh, uh, separate, separate presentation uh, but i can answer you detail after this session just contact me i'll answer you or whatsapp or anywhere through salman okay all right. So uh, I'm just uh, just one more one more comment, uh, last okay, comment. Okay. Thank, thank so you for the comments. No worries, please. Uh, well, now uh, the issue here is that uh, whenever we are let's say dealing with these kinds of issues or these kinds of aspects, in that case we have to basically have a we must have an integrated view or uh, to understand basically in which IFRS uh, we are referring to, or let's say which IAS we are referring to, isn't it? So yeah. then basically it becomes understandable. Otherwise, if we let's say only look at it from one uh, fragmented part uh, of let's say the whole uh, idea of uh, reporting, then it becomes more confusing and difficult, sometimes critical. Exactly. So that's what I'm trying to, I mean, so far I tried, uh, I could gather, I should rather say. And no, no one can give you correct answer. correct answer then you can do by yourself, right? Absolutely. <laughs>
because uh, for your understanding i can give you one suggestion for all of you yes, guys like uh, all we all know ifrs.org website just uh, just spend a few amount of money and get a subscription to it and you will find an faq use on all the accounting standards and <laughs> and give some time from your hard day like the maximum 30 minutes and read those faqs and you'll get maximum answers to your queries okay thanks a lot i mean if you can uh, arrange another session it would be really uh, really great inshallah salman will do that for you salman uh, I, I don't know yeah. whether we continue for the more slides or we should end it and extend this session for the another day or something like that it's no, i think we can easy. quickly quickly go towards the uh, recognition part and let's see uh, uh, how we can we, we have 10 minutes uh, so i think we can try to cover some more Okay, I think we should cover the measurement aspect. So because okay. Sefudina also asked the same question, so I think he will get that answer as well, inshallah. Okay, my year, my. Okay, just be one, one, be one back slide. Okay, the measurement of the financial instrument. It will not take a much time because I think most of us just get a clear view about the classification of the financial assets and financial liability. Financial liability classification, I think we did not cover the, in the before slide, but let me tell you all the financial liabilities other than derivatives should be considered at the classification at amortized cost. Okay. Now come to the measurement aspect. IFRS 9 measurement aspect financial instrument there put up the two stages of measurement first is the initial measurement and then the subsequent measurement subsequent measurement the major measurement of the financial assets after its initial recognition okay initial measurement will depend on the classification you choose at the stage of classification of the financial assets or the liabilities okay for the initial measurement all the financial instruments all the financial assets or the liabilities okay should be should be measured at the fair value when you okay should be measured at the fair value through profit and loss uh, i think we should go to the next slide it will be easy for everyone to understand because there's a summary you know, and generalize it yeah this one financial asset plus financial liability subsequent measurement and initial recognition okay at initial recognition all the financial uh, all the financial assets and the liabilities will be measured at fair value through PNL plus the transaction cost. Okay. Sorry, there's an interruption. Uh, sorry. Let me tell you all the financial instruments, all the financial instrument will be classified at fair value plus transaction cost other than the financial assets which you have selected to classify at fair value through PNL. Other than those classification, I mean like fair value through OCI and fair and uh, and at amortized cost will be measured initially at fair value plus the transaction cost. Fair value plus transaction cost means the fair value is the value which is available in the market. Okay, there's a separate standard to calculate the fair value, which I'm not going in detail today, but you have the fair value of a financial asset or a financial liability plus the transaction cost. Transaction cost, basically the cost, cost incurred for the acquiring such financial asset. Like uh, in case of financial, as, uh, financial asset, there may be a brokerage cost okay or any other cause any other direct cost which is incurred by the company to acquire such kind of financial asset so that is the transaction cost so if you are classifying your financial asset or liability at amortized cost or fair value through oci then your initial recognition will be the fair value of that financial asset plus the transaction cost okay so it will be your initial recognition, your financial asset. Comes to the subsequent measurement. I just give a measurement synopsis here in your on 
to your screen that how can we understand the subsequent measurement of financial asset and financial liability okay first we covered the fair value aspect a fair value aspect is the fair value through pnl or fair value through oci fair value through profit and loss it's very simple that every financial asset which you have classified at fair value through pnl will be directly route through pnl what example of it i i know you all you, you all will ask me this question that if is possible give me a journal entry for that it's easy not that difficult subsequent measurement for example at at 1st january 2021 you have recorded a financial asset and classify the financial asset at pnl you have recorded the financial asset at the fair value okay for example uh, what i would say like account receive uh, like uh, investment investment in abc company debit cash credit right this is your the financial asset is recorded investment in abc company debit and cash credit and this is an investment at fair value through pnl as per your business model test now at 31st december 2021 a reporting date what will you do if you have classified that financial asset at through prl that your subsequent measurement will be like you will assess the fair value of that financial asset okay you need to calculate you need to check you need to calculate based on the valuation techniques as per ifrs 13 you need to check what is the fair value for example if your if your financial assets fair value at the initial date this that means first first january 2021 is 100 so there is and at 31st december it is 120 saudi riyals then the 20 riyal gain will be directly charged to pnl profit or loss what will be the entry your entry will be simple investment debit and gain on investment credit and gain when investment should be the separate line item in your financial uh, in your profit statement of profit or loss and we will not go to the oci simple and very easy this is a subsequent measurement for any financial asset which you have classified through fair value through profit or loss <laughs> come towards fair value through other comprehensive income fair value through other other comprehensive income there can be two types of in instrument as we as i mentioned earlier in the session debt instruments and equity instruments this presentation or this summary will give you a clear guidance to it that if you have an equity instrument which you have classified through oci then the fair value with all the gains and losses recognized in oci changes in fair value are not subsequently recycled to pnl and dividends are recognized in pnl what is this explain okay in the equity instrument you you will receive some cash flows right what will be the cash flows the cash flows are the dividend cash flows because you have an equity instrument so you will receive some dividends where will these dividends go this dividends will be go to the your profit or loss and will not be in the other comprehensive income but any fair value changes for example you have recorded your equity instrument at on 1st january 100 riyals and for and 31st december 2021 at the reporting date the fair value you just examine is 120 riyal the 20 riyal will not is is an is a gain basically but it will be not part of the profit or loss and it will be the part of other comprehensive income directly okay this means that it will be part of your equity but not your part of the profit or loss understand because i know anyone can ask me that what will be the entry the entry is simple that investment debit gain on equity instrument is credited but that gain will be part of the oci this means it will be part of the equity but not the profit or loss i think it is understandable right <laughs> okay and the second part what i am telling you it's very important it's very important which is different from the debt instrument is that changes in fair value are not subsequently recycled to pnl what does it means it means that any fair value changes any fair value changes will not be covered through pnl at any later date at any later date means that you going to sell that equity instrument at let later date and then you will ask your auditor or your financial consultant that can i recognize 
the previous gains into the PNL as I as I'm selling this investment now, then they will tell you no because IFRS 9 tell you specifically that choosing the classification for an equity instrument is an irrevocable action. And if you choose a fair value through OCI option at your initial phase, then you can never come back to the PNL and you cannot recycle your gain to the PNL, your fair value gain to the PNL at any later date when you sell those equity instruments. Comes towards the debt instrument, fair value with all gains and losses other than those relating to impairment, which are included in PNL being recognized in OCI. This is simple. That fair value with all gains and losses other than those relating to impairment. Impairment means if there is any impairment in the debt instrument, because you are going to fair value through OCI, which are included in PNL being recognized in OCI. Okay. Uh, changes in fair value recorded in OCI are recycled to PNL on the re recognition or reclassification. This, this is a different between the debt instrument and equity instrument. I can summarize again. If you have classified your financial asset, that can be either equity instrument or can be either debt instrument. If you classify at initial recognition date, fair value through OCI, then on the subsequent date, any fair value gain and losses will be directly route through other comprehensive income. Okay. Now what, what is the difference? The difference is that at the later date, after one year, two year, you de-recognize or you disposed of your financial asset, which was initially classified as fair value through OCI. At that date, because you have disposed of that asset, you will ask your financial consultant. Now, I think all the gain I, I have should be again, should be re recycled to the, my profit or loss. So my profit can be increased. Then your financial consultant will tell you that as per IFRS 9, equity instrument gain cannot be recycled subsequently because you know you have an irrevocable action at the initial stage. But for the debt instrument, at the later date, when you de-recognize, disposed of the financial asset, which was initially classified as fair value through OCI, all the gain which have been in the OCI can be recycled to PNL on the disposal of date and on the disposal date, uh, on the disposal date, you can recognize the profit in your profit or loss for any gain or loss previously also with regard to the debt instrument. Okay. And okay. And the last subsequent measurement is also is very easy. That is amortized cost. Any financial asset or liability which has been classified initially at amortized cost will be subsequently also recorded as amortized cost using the effective interest rate method as per IFRS style. <coughs> effective interest rate method is basically as a brief overview, I can tell you an effective annual interest rate is the real rate on a saving account or any uh, investment or any bonds which you have as a financial asset where, where the effects of compounding over time are taken into account. It is also reflects the real percentage rate owed in interest on a loan or a credit card or any other debt. It is also called the effective interest rate. So I think if we are clear on it, this is the measurement part. Sarman, over to you. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, uh, we can stop here now. Uh, the people would have absorbed uh, a lot of from, uh, from today's uh, webinar. Uh, if we'll uh, uh, I think it's 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 a call. Uh, we'll ask from the participant. Let's see if we move further towards the other topic. Like we have uh, basically some more topics, impairment, and as well as if we move towards the uh, ECL model. Those are separate, comprehensive uh, topic. Uh, due to you know many question answers, we I think we should stop here. Otherwise, uh, people will stop. Uh, people will, you know, yeah. stop absorbing the, the other concepts. So we can have uh, another session, maybe after a month or so, uh, on the remaining uh, areas. Like for example, we can say the impairment, and then 
uh, detailed discussion on the ECL general ladder as well as the simplified model and then degree recognition we can add somehow. So um, it's it's a call on the participant side. Should we cover uh, Ibrahim? What you say should be covered or should we should we stop and then we, we should have I, I separate think, session? I think we should stop here. I mm -hmm. think if and it's up to the participants. They should add, the, add their comments to, uh, on the IFA LinkedIn page about their experience of today's webinar, and they will add that what else they if if you if they want me as a speaker to give another sessions, another webinar webinars on the other sessions, also on the another yeah. aspects of IFRS nine that that will be helpful for us to arrange a session quickly, right? Mm. Yeah, someone asked uh, at the start, uh, and they were interested. To, to listen about the ECL model, um, I, I, as, uh, you know, I texted, yes, we are going to cover, but because of, you know, uh, this long uh, other session, uh, like uh, due to long, uh, basically, you know, a session on other areas, uh, I think we can stop today and then uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk about uh, it again later. Um, and um, they can uh, see my contact details in this page and they can also directly come to from Salman as well, or from yeah. directly to this contact. Also, I'm available on WhatsApp as well. So mm -hmm. all you guys can have this contact details. And uh, as Imran's question and one of the uh, one of other questions, I do, mm -hmm. I did not uh, remember, but yeah, from the Kamral Bari, we have a question. Also, he can ask directly through my WhatsApp. Inshallah, I will answer him as soon as yeah. I if, okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Okay, so. Yeah. So, so uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining again. Uh, the last message is uh, uh, for the members: uh, you have to file your annual return uh, as well as your uh, uh, next year renewals by 31st December. Otherwise, uh, you will face disciplinary issues. Um, and um, thank you so much, the participants, as well as the. Thank you so much, uh, Ibrahim, for your valuable time. And uh, I believe that today's uh, session was uh, uh, very well comprehended. Uh, and uh, and uh, I have seen this was the first session where we are we are extending for another webinar. Uh, and uh, the people asked so many questions, and I believe so they would have uh, they would have got the answer of all their queries. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, everyone. We are going to end this webinar. We'll we'll be in touch and. Uh, uh, arrange another webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. You're welcome, guys.